Good afternoon. My name is Simon Cohen. I am chair of the Shalom Jewish Community, which is the most recently formed employee resource group at the lab. And this event is being recorded, and it is a hybrid event. So um, if you're online and you have questions for the end, please write them in the chat, and uh, we will deal with that at the end. And I uh, also want to just mention for Shalom Jewish Community, we have um, an event, uh, other events coming up, and they are announced on a Newsline uh, article that just came out today. So hopefully you can check those out. In the last two millennia, the Jewish people have experienced many moments of hardship due to anti-Semitism. But even the horrors of the Inquisition and expulsion from Spain in 1492, or the pogroms in Russia in the late 19th century, pale in comparison to the Nazi Germany's final solution and efforts to exterminate every Jew on earth during World War II. The systematic attempt by the Nazis to murder the entire Jewish race left a scar on the, those Jews who survived and to this day on Jews throughout the world. One Jewish grandparent was all that was required by the Nazis to consider you inferior and part of a race that they deemed unworthy of living. Today is Yom HaShoah, where we annually remember the Holocaust, Holocaust Remembrance Day. It is a somber day where we solemnly remember the six million innocent lives extinguished and repeat the mantra to never forget and never again. It is through this lens that our recently created employee resource group, Shalom Jewish Community, in coordination with the Lisa Author series, is so honored to introduce Henry Michalski. Henry, author of Torn Lilacs, was born in Kazakhstan in 1945. As a toddler and Jewish re refugee, he lived in a displaced persons camp in Germany until August 1949, when his family entered the US through Ellis Island and a year later emigrated to or moved to San Francisco. Henry graduated from San Francisco State University and immediately landed a full-time teaching job uh, in Napa Valley at the age of 22 and spent his entire career as a history teacher uh, and was once recognized as Teacher of the Year. As a freelance journalist, Henry covered 12 national political conventions for various media outlets and he has hosted three TV shows and been a public access TV uh, pers personality for KVON radio. A few years ago, Henry wrote Torn Lilacs to share the miraculous and harrowing story of his family's survival through the Holocaust and the Russian Gulag. Ladies and gentlemen, Henry Michalski. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. I want to meet this guy. That was terrific. Very nice. Thank you, uh, Simon. I really appreciate that. And uh, Melissa, thank you so much for everything you've done to make this day possible. You're truly a treasure. You're a gem. And Kelly, I don't know where you are, but uh, what a staff. You have an amazing staff here. I don't think Dr. Logan is here, Larry Logan, but I want to thank him also for making this possible. Um, I am personally, can I step out here? I, I'm deeply honored to be here, uh, Lawrence Livermore Lab, uh, to tell my story. That's my picture right there, my mom holding me. Cute little boy. Um, where do you start a story like this? Uh, today, when, when uh, Melissa first called a couple months ago and we arrived at this date, I had no idea that it was going to be Yom HaShoah. And it's kind of a perfect confluence of events. We just had the 80th anniversary, the liberation of the Warsaw Ghetto. Today is the 78th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. We call it Yom HaShoah, or Holocaust Remembrance Day. It's also a, a very in, important time of year. The seasons change. It's spring. Spring, hope uh, springs eternal during this time of year. It's the time when the world worships and thanks God for the sustenance that they've been blessed with. It's Easter, it's Ramadan, it's Passover, it's all those things coming together. And what an honor for me to be here today. Uh, 
we're gonna, next week we'll have Yom Hazikaron, which is the day that we honor the fallen soldiers of Israel in defense of Eretz Israel and victims of terrorism internationally. That's followed immediately by Israel's Independence Day. In May, Israel will have turned 75 years of age. Unfortunately, very sad for me, not one day of peace, and yet they are a startup nation, the fifth happiest country in the world. Amazing. And if you haven't been there, <laughs> you need to go. Um, I'll start at the beginning. I was born in Kazakhstan in 1945 between VE Day, the end of the war in Europe, and VJ Day, the end of the war in Japan. I was born on August the 3rd. The war had ended. Uh, what my parents were doing in Kazakhstan is amazing. You're gonna have to read the book, but we'll get there in a second. Uh, it was after the war. They now had myself, Jerry. They did not want to stay in Russia. Stalin uh, had um, uh, encouraged people to stay and become Russian. They had lost 20 million people in what they called the Great Patriotic War against fascism. And they wanted to repeople the country and they were giving provisions for anyone that had a baby. If you had a baby, you got flour and milk and things. But my parents didn't want to live in the great workers' paradise in uh, Russia, which, uh, which was uh, the great land of equality, of suffering, that is, of course. Uh, they saw enough of that in Russia. They dreamed of going back to Europe and reestablishing their lives in Poland and living there as, uh, as they planned to do. They left Kazakhstan, just like in the old documentaries, you see these lines of refugees walking for miles. My father tied me to his front. He tied Jerry to the back. He held everything we owned. My mother couldn't walk then. She had a, a tapeworm of all things. Uh, she had many <laughs> uh, challenges, we'll say. But we finally got back to Europe and that's where the enormity of the Holocaust was revealed to my parents. They heard stories, bits and pieces. No one could believe that these outrageous things they were hearing actually happened. But when they came to Europe, it became painfully, uh, painfully obvious that they had lost their entire families. And I can't even imagine what they went through at that particular time. I think Abba Ibn said it best when he described those horrid years, when he described the Holocaust. He said, from the darkest depths of man's divided nature, there sprang at the throat of the Jewish people the most violent hatred that had ever convulsed the life and spirit of mankind. Nothing even comes close to the systematic murder, genocide, of an entire people, not to mention the gypsies and the gay and all the other people who didn't quite meet up to the Nazi standard. This is a part of history that fascinates all of us still to this day. We are just amazed that a place like Germany that gave us Brahms, Beethoven, uh, Mozart could produce something as today we call the Holocaust. It's unbelievable. So. We ended up in what we call a DP camp. Can somebody tell me DP, what that stands for? You know, <laughs> displaced persons. We ended up in a displaced persons camp. And I just found out recently, after the book was written, I was in Florida last year at the Holocaust Museum, and the guy did a little research, and he said, did you realize that your camp, which was in southern Germany, in Bavaria, in Traunstein, the Lager, we called it, the camp, our DP camp. He says, did you know that it was for Jews only? I didn't know that. And I said, why? He said, because it wasn't safe for Jews to be with other people after the war. They were still killing Jews. And in Szczecin, where they landed when they came in from Asia, uh, they had to barricade the doors. They had to live together. If they went shopping, they had to go in groups. They were killing Jews after the war. My father in Cuba, my uncle, went back to Gustanin, our little town. My mother stayed behind, she was too sick, but he had to see for himself, what does this town look like? Where are the Jews? Is the synagogue still standing? He went there and it was bleak. He said, not a Jew left. 
Even the gravestones were used as pavers. The synagogue was gone. There was not a sign of Yiddishkeit. My mother couldn't believe it. She said, I've got to go. She ended up going back in 1977 with my father. They had to see Gustinine with their own eyes. So we're in this DP camp for a few years, actually. Nobody wanted Jews. Nobody wanted to take us in. Not France, England, Spain, nobody. Finally, one very happy day in the Laga. I'm four years old, Jerry seven. My father comes home from work. He's got a smile on his face, which was very unusual. He was morose, for good reason. And he was waving a piece of paper. And he called me and Jerry together, my mother, and he said in Yiddish, Morgen at Megayen of a Grosse Schiffs America. And Jerry started jumping up and down. He was happy. I figured I should be happy too. I started jumping up and down. We're going to America, the greatest place in the world. The next day, sure enough, we went up to Bremenhofen, north of Germany. It was an American destroyer. It was called the General Muir, and it was converted into an immigrant ship, packed with refugees like us. And um, I remember seeing the ship with my brother. We looked at it like this. We couldn't see the end of it. It was so big. And we figured America's probably just on the other side of that boat. <laughs> it's such a big boat. Well, I'm on this boat for two weeks. And uh, I won't go into detail, but we had some pretty shocking experiences there as well. Uh, finally, everyone comes on board. You've seen the old documentaries where everybody's pointing at the Statue of Liberty and the tears and the ground. And, and Jerry, we saw the cars in Manhattan go, hundreds of cars, and they were all black, shiny. And Jerry kept saying, that's my uncle. You know, Uncle Sam was going to meet us at the ferry. That's uh, <laughs> um, First, Ellis Island. You don't just go to New York. Uh, and in Ellis Island, we heard that there was a woman on the board that contracted tuberculosis, and she would not be admitted into the United States. And my mother was horrified. She grabbed me and Jerry like this and said, oh, I wish, I hope. And they did all the tests on the teeth and the eyes. We passed, thank God. And then we had to take a little ferry to Manhattan. And I said, no way. I didn't want to see another boat as long as I lived. I had enough of boats and vomit and all the rest. I said, I'm not going. And my father kept saying, just right over there where those big buildings are, we're just, just there. I said, nope. I was like this, stubborn. And I dug in my heels. I think I was the first person actually dragged into America. <laughs> and when we got to New York, me and Jerry are like this. We're going like this. You know what we're doing? We're, we're, what are we looking for? Gold. Gold. <laughs> We're looking for gold because on the ship, that's all we heard, that there's, the streets are paved with gold in America. You know, just if you have any acumen at all, just you can make it. Well, that's, that was what you had to do. You had to make it somehow. And uh, New York was tough for my parents. You know, the cold, freezing in the winter, humid, hot in the summer. We lived in Brooklyn in one of those four-story four cold-water tenements. For a view, we had a chimney and broken glass. Eh. My mother, the fear, she says to my father, you know, we survived Siberia, we survived the Nazis, we survived, we're going to California. It never rains out there. <laughs> and the next day, we're on the train. Of course, we went to Madison Square Garden first. My father wanted to treat us to the greatest show on, in the world. And uh, we're in Madison Square Garden, packed, you know, throngs of people, and all of a sudden, Jerry's gone. My mother can't find Jerry. She screams, Jerry, Jerry. And there was throngs of people. We couldn't find him. And she's gone hysterical crazy. And we find Jerry. He's looking at the bearded woman like this. He was fascinated by the bearded woman. My mother grabbed him and said, never again. Got on a train, California. 1950. It was the centennial year of uh, California statehood. I was thrown into a kindergarten class. Didn't speak a word of English. And as time went on, I became kind of cognizant of the fact that we were a little different. I heard the word refugee quite a lot. Newcomer, greenhorn, uh, green highest. I heard all these uh, pejoratives. Um, and, and we spoke Yiddish. And I had matzah sandwiches at Pesach. And I, and I heard stories. And I heard words that a five-year-old should not hear. I heard about amputations 
and Nazis chasing, and, and I had bad dreams. I'm dreaming like the Nazis are chasing me, and my feet are in concrete, and I can't move. And I tried to scream, and nothing came out. And my mother, she also was screaming. She saw the Nazi eyes. She couldn't get those eyes out of her head. She finally went to Mount Zion Hospital in San Francisco. They gave her a test drug. They said, we don't know what this is. Don't ask. Just drink it. It might help you. And the, uh, the screams stopped. It was amazing. But I used to watch her when she dressed. And she always talked about her 15 holes. She had 15 holes in her. And she talked about gangrene and this and that. And as time went on, I became interested in history. You know, why did this happen? And in my friend's house, when the news came on, they would turn the music on. In my house, when the news came on, they would say, shh, the news is on. How does this affect the Jews? Is this good for us? Is this bad? Eisenhower, is he OK? Stevenson, who should we go for? That kind of thing. Uh, it was always part of our growing up. And finally, my mother always talked about it. It was amazing. You know, they say people who experience trauma don't talk about it much. My father didn't, but my mother did. She wanted her story out there. And as time came on, I became a history teacher. I was very interested in this. And she saw my writing. She said, Henry, you're going to write the book. You're going to tell the story. The world has to know my suffering. So it doesn't happen to anybody else. History repeats, and it gets more intense every time. And it's really important that this book get out there. I suffered tremendously. you got to tell that story. I said, whoa, that's quite a burden. I don't know. And it took time. I have to admit, it took a lot of time. I sat him down, did interviews, went to Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, went to Gustinin in Poland. I actually surprised them there when they went in 1977. I went there, did a lot of research, and I finally put out the book in 2020. It was October, with fear and trepidation. How would this be received? What would people think? It's got my name on the cover. Those are my parents. Well, the reviews started coming in, and I was, I was just blown away. I just couldn't believe it. It was, it just was so gratifying, such an amazing feeling that people are reading this book and learning from it. And I have to say, my proudest moment is when a rabbi who was asked to teach a course on the history of anti-Semitism at Sonoma State College asked me if it was okay if he used my book as required reading. How long do you think it took me to answer him? <laughs> like five seconds? And he did it two years. Anyway, it's, uh, it's amazing. It's an amazing story that my parents have. It's a, and I think part of the reason that it works, it's a love story. I have to admit to you, I cannot read what they call Holocaust stories. I can't read them anymore. I've read them up to here. I've seen the documentaries. I don't see any change in the world. If anything, it's getting worse out there. Um, and yet, I think this book is working because it's a love story. The intensity of the love between my parents was palpable. You could feel it. And they would do anything to find each other. And when you read the book, at one point, he saves her life, she saves his life, and they're bound forever. 54 years of marriage. <clears throat> Every book has to have a uh, quote at the beginning, I think. And there's so many fabulous quotes. I was going to put 25 here, but I chose two. <laughs> and I'm only going to read one, which I think this audience in particular is going to like. Because you are, let's face it, you're the brightest stars in the galaxy right here at Lawrence Livermore. I mean, some amazing things happen here. And I think you're going to relate to this quote. It's from, it's from David Ben-Gurion. A Jew who does not believe in miracles is not a realist. Think about that. Since there was no reaction, I'm going to read you the other one. <laughs> you didn't react to the other Maybe you'll react to this one. This is from Herman Woke, who wrote, This is my God. He wrote, The Torah prophesied that a remnant of the people would survive a long agony of exile undergoing ordeals of wanderings and persecution, that they would never die out, and that in the far after time, they would return to live in Israel, to live by the laws of Moses, and to be a light unto the nations. 
That's who we are. Startup nation. Every book has to have a beginning, right? Where do you start a book like this? I decided, you know, the first uh, version had my mother as a little girl polishing silver candlesticks. <laughs> That's good. And 40, like Michener, you know, 100 pages later, you finally get to the good stuff. I said, you know what? We're just going to get right to the good stuff. It's called Yuska Meets Fella. My father, Yuska, Joe, Joseph, meets Fella. The club was crowded that evening, and despite the festive atmosphere, a palpable tension filled the air. Fella was singing and dancing on a table, teasing with her skirt to the beat. The olive-skinned beauty with the dark, dancing eyes was the crowd's favorite, singing old Polish and Yiddish folk songs like a seasoned entertainer. Ever since she was a little girl in Poland, Fella loved to perform, but that night, she was beaming at her admirers, singing with extra feeling, eager to bring them a smile and a little relief from the gloom of war's impending madness. War, after all, was, coming, was on everyone's mind. War was coming to Poland. So she's an entertainer. She's singing and dancing. My father is six years older, and he comes home. He's on leave. He's in the Polish cavalry. Uh, the war, it's eminent, it's 1938, uh, and he's home on leave, and he decides to go to that club that night with his friend Edgar, okay? <clears throat> that night, the Halutzim, uh club clubhouse was de a deserted barn on the outskirts of town, was filling with young friends talking politics, debating and reading, smoking cigarettes and playing chess, but mostly enjoying each other's company and safety and security. At the moment, however, they were listening with rapt devotion to the ever popular and lively Fela Kuvent. Many heads turned in curiosity and admiration as Yoska and Edgar entered the hall. Yoska was immediately struck by the beauty of the young girl singing and dancing on the table. He could not believe his eyes. Fella was the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. She was wearing the familiar sky blue scarf of her club over a gray blouse, along with a flared patterned skirt and white leather shoes. Her black hair was parted down the middle and combed back, held by a knotted kerchief. She was clearly enjoying the moment, smiling into friends and exuding happiness. Her exotic dark eyes the kind that pierced the very soul of a man. And her sweet voice, chirping like a little bird, captivated Yuska. At that moment, he fell instantly and hopelessly in love. It was beshared, he thought, meant to be. One day, this beauty will be my wife. The intensity of his love, my friends, was that of a magnetic approach to a confined thermonuclear reaction. <laughs> Fusion. And here I am. Anyway, the war breaks out. My father goes to the war. He's called to action, active duty. I hope you can raise your hand if you can't. Uh, my father is left for dead on the battlefield. During the, he's in a big, battle, the Stuka bombers are coming. They say the fog of war, the confusion, the hysteria, the pandemonium, people running in all directions. He gets a, a chunk of shrapnel, hits his helmet, and he goes down in a heap. And the men see him, and they leave. They figure he died. They left him for dead. That word comes back to Gustanin that Yuska is dead. And you can imagine the scene. They're sitting Shiva. You know, he's got uh, two brothers and two sisters and par the whole community. The loss of a, it was terrible. And at that time, it was really the confluence of a number of events happened. Yuska was dead. My mother had a cousin in a nearby village who needed an operation for a brain tumor. They thought she got the tumor for standing out in the cold without a head covering. And I don't think that causes a tumor in the brain. But 
they came to the town of Gustinine, where my mother was, uh, because we had a hospital. The girl recovered. It took her a long time to convalesce. The signs went up all over Gustinine saying, all men ages 15 to 50 report to the train station. You're going to go to a secure, protected area. You all know what I'm talking about. So here, now look at this scene. A letter arrives. It's cold, miserable. It's January, freezing outside. The postman comes with a special letter. It's from Yuska. He's alive. He's in a place called Olesko in western Ukraine. He was captured by the Russians. He's a POW. He's in Jan Sobieski's castle. Jan Sobieski, great king in the 16th century Poland. They converted the castle into a POW camp. He was there. He writes a letter back and he says, come be with me. I'll take care of you. I'll protect you. I'll feed you. So there's a meeting that night in the house. Now imagine this scene. It's January the 10th, 1940. Horizontal snow, it's freezing, blizzard. The family's meeting, and it had to be a, an amazing meeting where my mother's father essentially says, in the morning, you, fella, and your brother, Kuba, Jacob Kuba, you're gonna go with the farmer and his daughter. He came to pick up his daughter. He had a wagon with hay in it, and he was gonna uh, take his daughter home, okay? So it was decided that in the morning, my mother and her brother would get in that wagon and try to get through the checkpoints and try to get to eastern Poland, cross the river Bug. The Bug River separated the German sector from the uh, Russian sector of Poland. They had divided Poland without their acquiescence. They just divided Poland. They needed to get on the other side of the Bug River The fellow thinks, and, and Kuba goes, you're out of your mind. We're going to leave in the morning? Oh, my God. It's freezing outside? No one helps a Jew. If they help you, you know, for a bottle of vodka, they turn you in, the whole family. You're not going to survive out there. But they had no choice. The father says, I hate to do it, but there's no future here. If you stay here, you're going to go to the camp. They're killing all of us. Go try. In the morning, just like in the movies, there's a wagon with hay. The young girl who had the operation sitting on the front with her father. My mother and her brother go under the hay, okay? He covered, he puts a tarp over them, throws the hay on top, just like in the movies, and they get to the first checkpoint, and their hearts are going like this, you can imagine. Luckily, because of the weather, the soldiers were too, uh, too they just barked out some questions, and the farmer responded, and they let him go without incident. It was amazing. But that was just the beginning. They're holding each other in the wagon, my mother and her brother. And they're talking, and they're saying, my God, this is just the beginning. We just started. And we've got to get a couple hundred kilometers. We've got to go across. Well, what happens along the way takes up a good half of the book, because some unspeakable kind of things happen. People are dying all over, people of this, that. For some reason, they were meant to live. It was Bishert. It was like destiny. Some, it's amazing. They finally get to my father's village, to that town of Olesko. They finally make it after months of harshness on the road and near misses and all kind of catastrophe. They make it. And there they stay a short while. They're called Bijonets, which is a pejorative, you know, newcomers, people that are just hanging around the castle. A lot of ladies there because their men were hold up as POWs. The Russians, of course, uh, it was inevitable. They gathered all these bisonettes in the middle of the night, always, the knock on the door, put them on a train, and it took months because the train stopped and lost its way, and finally, they were all taken to Siberia, slave labor, zeks. They were a zek, which is uh, human beings were expendable. Uh, they were like uh, horses. They were, you could always replace a zek. They called them uh, fodder for the meat grinder. You just used up a human being, and they would always be replaced with other human beings. My mother's job in Siberia, way up in Siberia, it was an island prison with rivers on all sides, and it was all forested. Her job was to, well, they had a group of girls on top of the hill chopping trees. 
they would send the timber down to the water where my mother and another brigade of girls were working on the water, lashing the logs together, creating large rafts. And those rafts would be sent down the river to the mill to be harvested into lumber, okay? And that was her job. Well, <laughs> meanwhile, uh, my father, he's in the POW camp, remember him back in, okay. Well, General Anders, Vladimir Anders, a Polish general, started uh, a corps of captured uh, Polish soldiers to fight on the British front. Great Britain was the last holdout against the Nazi empire. So a lot of his friends lied. They, they had to lie about their religion so they could get into General Anders' army and go fight with the British. And my father's friends in the camp said, lie to them. Tell them you're Polish, you're Catholic, and you can go to England, you'll eat, you can kill Nazis, you'll fight, you'll have a, you know, you'll, you'll fight, you'll be a soldier. My father said, why would I lie about my religion? This is insanity. He says, if I'm a free man, and I know fella is somewhere in Siberia, because he got a letter, you know, he knew she was up there. Uh, he says, I'm gonna go find fella. They said, are you out of your mind? Siberia is the size of 20 Polands. You don't even know where you're going. You're just going to take trains up there? My father was one of those kind of guys. That's a, he says, I'm going to find her. He says, if she's there, I'm going to find her. <laughs> so he's riding trains. He's way up in Siberia somewhere. He's looking for her. He doesn't realize that she's gone. What happened was, the Russians were now capturing tens of thousands of Nazi prisoners after the Stalingrad and the Great War broke out. And they needed that camp in Siberia for those captured Germans. And so the commandant of the camp said to all the civilians, you're free to go. We're not giving you transportation. We're not going to waste, squander uh, precious fuel on buses or trains or anything, you can go, walk, do whatever you want. We prefer for you to stay. So my mother had enough of uh, the worker's paradise. She said, we're going. We're going where it's warm. And she called a meeting. A couple hundred people showed up. And she said, we're going to get out of here. And they said, how are you going to go? She said, well, we're going to make a raft. <laughs> and we're going to go down the rivers. The rivers in Siberia run north-south. We're going to go south, south, south until we get to a warm spot. And most of them thought they were insane. They said, you're out of your mind. You're going to get on these wild rivers on a raft without a GPS? I mean, <laughs> who goes without GPS these days? <laughs> so about 40 people were strong, mostly young people. They said, we're going to go with Fella. She was now the, the commander. She was Captain Fenya. Uh, they built two rafts. The night before they left, some of the men went into the commissary, stole whatever they could find, food, blankets, and off they went. You can imagine, I can't even imagine this scene. It, it, I think about this. Siberia, uh, two weeks on a raft going south, people are dying. Some got a funeral. You know, at night they would maybe pull over and bury them if they were lucky. Uh, a few were just thrown over the side. My mother said they just blew up like this, and their eyes became like little marbles, real glassy little marbles. Little. And she said they just had to throw them over. There's no. And her best friend on that boat, Anya, had a baby on the, on the raft, had a baby. I, I can't believe what my parents went through. It's unbelievable. Meanwhile, my father is, where is he? <laughs> he's, he's on trains, right? And he's looking for her. And uh, he, he told me that he always sat by the, by the window. No matter where, what train he got on, he always, and he loved to look out the window to see, maybe he's going to find somebody he knows, maybe uh, an interesting landmark, an archaeological uh, surprise, something. Well, <clears throat> I'm just going to read you this little section here, okay? So think about this. Uh, she's on a raft, and she's going down, and of course they end up in Kazakhstan, where I was eventually born. He's up in Siberia, thousands of miles away. 
looking out the window. Tired from lack of sleep, Yoska instinctively gazed out the window, as was his custom. Opening it up to get some fresh air, he was greeted by a cacophony of commotion. His eyes rested for a moment on a young, red-cheeked, energetic boy hawking chai, his face all smiles. The boy brought back memories of Gustanin. Then, out of the corner of his eye, Yoska caught eye of what appeared to be a familiar face in the crowd, a fellow Lundsman, a local from Gustanin. Incredible as it seemed, Yoska was positive it was his childhood friend, Yankel Zaidemann. In absolute disbelief, Yoska called out the window, Zaidemann! Afraid his friend might not have heard, he called out again, Zaidemann! Yankel Zaidemann turned towards the sound of his name. After a few moments, he realized, much to his shock and amazement, that it was his old schoolmate, Yoska, calling out his name from the train. Beaming with happiness at seeing a familiar face so far from home, Zaidemann shouted, Yoska, where are you going? I'm going up to Siberia to find Fella. Sending out a sharp whistle and billows of coal smoke, the loaded train began its slow departure from the station. Running alongside it, Zaidemann shouted to his friend, If you're looking for Fella, get off the train. You're going in the wrong direction. Quick, get off. In a flash, Yuska gathered his belongings, but the train was already out of the station and picking up steam. Without hesitation, he opened the compartment door, hurled out his bags, and jumped off the train. Fortunately, he was, an ex he was experienced in leaping out of moving trains. Like an athlete, he made a few somersaults, dusted himself off, and bounded to his feet. And he was a pretty tough guy. And and Zaidemann says, you know, I saw them a couple days ago. They came through here. And my father is all excited. He goes, how did they look? Is she good? Does she feel good? Is she healthy? Was Kuba with her? And he goes, you know, I didn't have a chance to talk about There were so many people coming and going. We just greeted each other. I know they're going south. They were going to Kazakhstan. My father never heard of Kazakhstan. So he says, so <laughs> your wife... Uh, his friend says, come to my house, you'll rest up, I want you to meet my wife, we'll eat. In the morning, you'll go find your fella. My father says, no way. If I know she's in Kazakhstan, I'm going on the next train. And his friend says, boy, you're stubborn. You've always been stubborn, even as a child. Boy, you just don't give up, do you? And uh, he couldn't, at that point, and I'm going to share with you. I, he, t he told my father, said, turn off the tape recorder, I've got to tell you something. I said, what, what, you got a secret? What? He says, you know, me and your mother never, and he made a gesture, okay? He says, me and your mother, and he says, I was so excited, I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. I was on that train, I know I'm going to find her. Now I'm going in the right direction. <laughs> he finally gets to Jambul, big city. It's now, it goes by a different name now, in Kazakhstan. And he's thinking, you know, when the train gets in, she's going to be there with flowers, and there's going to be a band playing, and, you know, maybe some food laid out for them. Uh, and, of course, uh, it was just a mess. It was just a, a, a confusion of humanity in all directions, every kind of person, every kind of language. And he's looking, he just can't find her, and he's shown pictures. You know, did you see this girl, you know? And he was told no in 15 different languages, or yeah, or just a gesture. And uh, he's all over it. He's, he can't find her. He doesn't know what to do. And he's, uh, one guy said, yeah, I think she's down by the river. And he goes down there, but he takes the wrong turn. He, he's calling out her name, screaming, and it's filthy, disease, uh, pandemics. It was typhus and cholera, dysentery. People were dying. It was just terrible. Um, so he, he's almost ready to give up. He's despondent. He thinks maybe she took up with another man. Maybe she's dead. Maybe she's not even in Kazakhstan altogether. And he says, well, I'm going to go to the Red Cross. They were giving, they were passing out coffee from the back of a truck. And he says, I'm going to wait in line for some coffee. And he's waiting. And as was his habit, he would always look around, you know, who's... And he looks around in the back of the line. He sees, you know, some, he sees a man. And he looks at him. 
And he goes up to him and he goes, oh my God, it was Kuba. It was my mother's brother. I see your face. I feel like crying too. <laughs> um, well, you can imagine that scene. But that was like, they said, forget the coffee. I'm going to... So they started walking, and he's saying, how is fella? And, and Kuba goes, well, yeah. what's wrong? What's going on? Well, it turns out that she was uh, sick with typhus fever. She was down to something like 80 pounds. She had lost all of her hair. She was coughing out of... Con she would be dead in another day or so. She would be dead. So he tells Kuba to go into the city and get some coffee. Seven kilometers. They live way under the city by a scummy little road where they urinated and drank the same water, where disease was rampant, where they paid rent by how much space you took on the floor. You know, you paid by how much you took it. Can you imagine? So Kuba says, come, I'm going to show you. I'm going to take you to her. You're going to meet her. And she's very close to death. And she has a dream. And I'm just going to read you her dream, because she told me this. And I did a little work on it. But she goes into a fever dream. She says to Kuba, take a chair and put it outside so I can sit in the sun. And I'm going to sit here. And you go into the town and see if you can bring something. Maybe coffee, maybe a chicken, whew, maybe some garlic, whatever you can find. And she goes into a fever dream. She has this premonition. After her brother's departure, Fella sat slumped in the padded chair, a blue woolen cap covering her shaven head. She shifted, trying to get comfortable facing the coming soothing sun. It was warm, and the sun shone on her face. She soon fell into a strange and restless sleep, then into a deep dream heightened by a fever. Fella dreamed that she had entered an eerie world of repetitious events and other worldly places full of vivid colors. Crystal clear visions appeared to her. Images of people in her life danced in her head. She saw her father. He was sobbing. She saw her mother, Golda High, appear to her in the snow, saying, everything's going to be OK. You're going to live. She was an angel. From a distance, she saw two white horses approaching. There was a rider on one of them. From afar, she could clearly see that the man on the horse was smiling. He was a tall, striking Polish soldier in a starched and spotlessly clean uniform. He was galloping towards her resplendent in his sword and sash. He had on a peaked hat over his rich black hair. She recognized the well-fed soldier. It was Yaska. With her eyes closed, she could clearly see him now, smiling, healthy, alive. He came to her. He leaned down from the horse and whispered, don't worry, I'm here now. I will protect you. She smiled. The soldier then lifted her with the greatest of ease and gently cradled her in his lap on the horse. She was in the wedding dress, white and flowing, and everyone was happy. Kuba and Mashka were there too, Yaska, and fell in his arms, and they ascended on their snowy steed into the blindingly light heavens. They were flying, floating, soaring in great circles. She felt no pain, only lightness. She drifted in the arms of her lover, hovering high above wide green pastures. She was free. And then, very slowly, she opens her eyes. She comes out of the dream, she opens her eyes. And who's standing right there? Her betrothed, her, her lover, my father, to be, and an uncle. And my poor father, you know, they didn't have a lot of education in those days because the first thing he said is, you look terrible. <laughs> Which, you know, you don't say that to a woman. And, and, and any, you'd never say that to a woman if you want to get lunch the next day, for sure. Uh, but, uh, and, and immediately he took off his coat 
And he said, Kuba, go into town. All, it was all barter for money. Money was useless. Go into town, bring back food, whatever you can find. Kuba dutifully goes the seven kilometers into town, trades, eats. Then he sends you know, the blanket. Then he, then he trades his boots. Pretty soon he's half naked. And he says, she ate up all my clothes. I, I got to get a job. <laughs> so he gets a job. And eventually, as she gets healthy, they uh, plan a wedding day, April the 20th. Be tomorrow would be their, their anniversary. Uh, they planned a wedding date. And uh, you can imagine this scene. There was a common criminal standing next to them. They didn't have a rabbi. My mother made herself a dress. She was a seamstress back in Poland. And she took burlap sacks that the Red Cross was throwing out and fashioned herself a beautiful dress with a red sash. She still had the short cropped hair, but she did something with her hair. And she looked quite beautiful. My father took a five groschen coin that he carried in his pocket for luck. And he hammered out a, a ring. And he promised her <coughs> that uh, yeah. <laughs> he promised her that he's going to put a diamond ring on every single finger. And you know what happened. You, know, you knew my mother. That's right. She had that diamond on every finger. And then, of course, um, it was time. They, they didn't want to stay in Kazakhstan. And they said goodbye to the, all their friends. And it was a painful farewell. And they decided they're going to go back to Poland. And that's where I came in. I told you that they were walking. He had Jerry in the front, me, DP camp, came to America. And here we are today. Um, you, know, you know what motivated, I'll just tell you one story. What really motivated this book, I taught history. And when we taught this segment of history, the Second World War, I would mention, you know, six million Jews were murdered. And I looked at my students and their eyes were glazed. Who can relate to six million? Who relates to that kind of number? So I decided, you know, I'm going to make it a little more personal. I'm going to tell the story of my parents. And I did that for 36 years. Every year, five times. Every year when we got to that part, it was the best day out of the school year. They were quiet. <laughs> they sat in their seats. Their mouth, they were like this. And when the bell rang, nobody moved. They, they, they were in tears. They would come up to the front of the desk, Mr. Mikulski, you got to write this book. You got to write this book. And my friends, you know, if anti-Semitism didn't resurge the way it's doing right now, I wouldn't have to write this book. If we were accepted as other human beings, as being normal. But uh, it's, it's, the hatred is palpable. Every day I get what I call stomach punches when I read the news. What's going on with Jewish people around the world? Most of it does not get in to the corporate media. It just doesn't make it. And, um, and the Holocaust denial. It's like a cottage industry. How can you deny this? And yet, many people, it, it's very prevalent. Very prevalent. They say, well, it was an exaggeration. Yes, a few died of typhus. That's a, no, I'm here as a living testament to what my parents went through. And it's how I'm dedicating the rest of my life to telling this story to people, ordinary people. They weren't diplomats or generals or rich. They just wanted to get married and have a family like anyone else. And they were uprooted from their home, hence the title of the book, Torn Lilacs. I feel we're all torn lilacs, everybody in this room. We all are. But they were torn. They were uprooted from their home, from their village, from their family. And they had to run for their lives. They were strewn like delicate flowers to the world. It's an oxymoron, I know. Torn lilacs. But the title seems to work. And I really appreciate your time this morning, this afternoon. I really appreciate it. And again, to Melissa for having me here. And to all of you, thank you very much. It's an honor for me to be here. Tremendous honor. We'll have questions. Thank you very much. I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions, um, and we've got some folks online that may have questions. Anybody want to ask something of Henry before we? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 
I'm going to ask again, and I know you told us a little bit, but I feel like there's more. I'm in love with the name Torn Lilacs and the visual image. Can you speak a little bit more? I mean, why the lilacs? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, you see what she's holding in her hands? Those are lilacs. That was her favorite bush. <laughs> and my father brought her bundles of lilacs. And I lived in Napa most of my uh, teaching life. <clears throat> and I knew every lilac bush. And in the evening, when people <laughs> with my scissors, <laughs> Um, I would bring her, because I visited her in San Francisco every week, I, I would bring her a bundle of lilacs and a fragrance all over the house. It was her favorite scent. She loved lilacs, and that always evoked that photograph, one of the few surviving photographs of her holding the lilacs. I asked my friend Bob, who made the cover for me, I said, could you colorize the lilacs? It's a black and white picture, but put a little color. It reminds me of Schindler's List. Did you notice in Schindler's List there's one spot of color? Where was it? The red jacket. That's right. The little girl with the jacket, who's, by the way, is very angry today. They just found that girl. Anyway, uh, so does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah. Simon. Henry, thank you very much for uh, your presentation and your sharing your, your family's story. Can you go into a little detail? You mentioned that um, they lost the fa all of your relatives. Is, did, did anyone else survive from Poland? I mean, everyone was living there, right? Just my mother in Cuba and my father. Uh, the, my mother had a sister also, Mashka. Uh, little, she was 12 years old, and she carried that picture with her every day. And she would cry almost every day. I mean, for some reason, more than her parents or anybody, she, she cried for her little sister, who looked like Anne Frank. I mean, she's a gorgeous little girl, smart. What did she do that deserved murder? I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's insanity. So she lost Mashka. My father, as I said before, had two brothers, two sisters, mom, dad, everybody. And that, that includes, of course, the extended family, aunts, uncles. So it was always just us five in San Francisco. It was just us five. Me and my brothers, Jerry and Georgie, and my mom and dad. And for Christmas, you know what we did? <laughs> kind of in a vicarious way, we would get in the car and go down the marina. You know the marina greens in San Francisco? Big houses with windows. My father would drive very slowly, and we'd look in the windows, and we'd see Christmas trees and people opening presents and gathering and drink, and we would kind of, you know, we were voyeurs, you know? <laughs> just kind of in a vicarious way, enjoying it that way maybe, and looking at the decorations. But we really never had a family, never had grandparents, which at that time a child doesn't know these things, because you got mom and dad, and you got security, and you got food. You got... And my friend Dan Bazard, who lived across the street, he would always say, uh, I would say, you want to play outside? He goes, well, I can't. I'm going to go see Granny. And I said to myself, hmm, what a concept. <laughs> granny, wow. And he always come back with little crispy dollar bills and food and candy and said, boy, I'd like to have one of those. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, what are you going to uh, You accept life as it is, and you make the best with what you have, and you get on with it. That's all. You just got to get on with life. And uh, thank God for this book, and, and that God really helped me find the right words to communicate the story. Uh, because that's my way of coping, I guess you would say, is teaching new generations about what happened in the hopes that it doesn't happen again, not only to my people, but to anybody. You know, uh, prejudice, judgments of other people. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. So could, could you tell us how your parents experienced VE Day in Kazakhstan, how long it took for the news to get there, and then when, what, were, what month did they leave Kazakhstan, how long did it take them to get to Poland, 
And then when did you enter the, the when did you and your parents enter the DP camp? Uh, I can't answer any of those exactly. I can only guess. I was a child. Uh, but I do know that August the 28th, 1949, the General Muir landed at Ellis Island. That's the date that we'd like to say we came to America. When they actually left the camp, I, I, I couldn't tell you the exact dates of all those things. What was the first one you wanted to know? I could help you there, maybe. When did you meet Papa John Fox? I was about uh, two years old, so it had to be around 47. Yeah, then two years in a DP camp, and then 49, we came to the US, right? I became an ardent American. <laughs> Throughout school, kids would always ask me, who am I? Because I've got, I'm kind of dark complected like my mom, olive skinned. And they would always come up to me in school and say, well, who are you? And I could never figure it out. Because I didn't feel Kazakhstani, I just happened to be born there. It was part of Russia, but I didn't feel Russian. My parents are Polish, but I certainly didn't feel Polish. And I was always confused by those kind of questions, you know? Uh, now I, but I, I feel very American. I love America. It's the country that took us in. And I have to be honest with you, I'm in a lot of pain right now seeing how this country is being denigrated by our own citizens in many, many ways. Uh, we're, we're not a perfect country. We're all, we're a uh, work in progress. But uh, what's going to replace this great country with? This is, this is still, this is the place I want to be. And this is the place most of the world wants to be. When you think about it, if we opened our doors, the world would flock here tomorrow. Truly the land of opportunity and hope. And I want to keep that. Yes, sir. So did your family find San Francisco a welcoming place? We had mishpucha here. That's a Yiddish word. It means relatives. We had a few relatives that helped us out. Uh, they were looking for community. That, that, well, actually, we started in the Fillmore District, where many of the newcomers in San Francisco landed. Uh, that's the western edition of San Francisco. We called it the Fillmore. We were on Ellis Street, and all the activity was Fillmore, and then McAllister was the main hub of the refugees. And that was, that was our social life. My parents obviously got to know other Grina, we would call them, other refugees. And they would come to the house on Chavez or whatever. I remember one guy uh, tattooed numbers here. And I'm a little boy and I'm looking at this. I'm, you know, it's kind of scary stuff. But uh, San Francisco in those days was a fabulous place to grow up. In the 1950s, we had our community in the Fillmore, but we didn't know of the crime that you have today, carjackings and this kind of drugs, you know, fentanyl. We didn't have any. We lived. You know, and if you played by the rules and were good, you, you could make it in this country. Look at my father. He didn't have a language, nothing. But he worked. And he eschewed victimhood like, like anything. He, he refused to be called a victim or to take a handout or to be given something that he didn't work for. He says, I'm an American. I'm strong. I'm going to work and earn it, which he did. Very proud of him. <clears throat> Any other last questions for Henry? I just want to say thank you. Um, I am so eternally grateful to your parents who um, were incredibly persistent yeah. to find one another because without that you would not be here today. So um, I would also like to say I, I'm sure your mother is incredibly proud of what you produced. Um, this is such an honor to have you here today. Um, you've given us such great kudos, but honestly, it's, it's an honor to have you here. So thank you so much for being here. Thank all of you for coming out today. We, are gonna re we did record this, so for your friends who didn't make it today, we'll have it released. You can watch it. You can share it with your family, so it'll be available externally. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much.